Craig Waters, who will be offering the message. chapter 21. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will ask, also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Well, so what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first son and said, go out today and work in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this... You did not repent and believe him. If like the leaders in today's lesson, you wonder by whose authority I am here, it was Voris. That should settle the issue. I see in today's lesson a contrast of words versus deeds. The first, the first son promised to obey them and then shirked his duty. Today we would call that passive aggressive. The second son said no, but then he went and did the work. Now, in my family, it was the opposite. I would say no up front, but my sister would promise and then not deliver. Her way actually kept the peace in the house. My father would beg me, just say yes, mother, and then do what you want. But I had to make a point. This story reminds me of the admonition that we are to be judged by our fruits. Christ is telling us, to me, that what we do matters more than what we say. Or as we would say today, talk is cheap. All sorts of folks ask Jesus questions in Matthew's gospel, and both their questions and Jesus' answers are striking. There are many different kinds of questions asked of Jesus. Both the baptizer and Pilate ask questions about Jesus' identity. John asks if he, if he is in fact the one they're looking for, and Pilate asks if he is king of the Jews. The Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, and chief priests and elders ask questions to try and trap Jesus. Why the disciples break the traditions of the elders for signs of proofs about divorce, taxes, resurrection, and the role of the commandments. By whose authority do you do the things you do? The disciples asked him questions. Who is the greatest among us? What good deed do we have to do to receive eternal life? For a sign concerning Jesus' coming at the end of the age. And for every other question someone else following Jesus asked, Peter would ask another. How often must I forgive? And we left everything for you. What do we get? These questions are all revealing. With the exception of John and perhaps ironically Pilate, the questions are all self-serving. Those who ask Jesus questions want to trap him, impress him, or get something from him. And to every pointed question, Jesus offers an equally pointed answer, which reveals the truth about the kingdom, the king, and his subjects. Here in Matthew 21, Jesus responds to the question put to him with a question of his own. The chief priests and elders ask Jesus where his authority comes from. His return question is about John the baptizer. He asked them if John baptism came from heaven or the human mind. The question reverses the trap with which the chief priests and elders are trying to set for Jesus. His accusers take the fifth, refusing to answer refusing to answer Jesus, lest it incriminate them in the eyes of the crowds. So Jesus doesn't answer their question about his authority either, but tells them a parable. The parable sets up a comparison of two sons, one who says he will do what his father asks, but doesn't, 
and one who says he won't but does. For every individual who hears the parable, the comparison helps them or forces them to answer the question, which am I? Am I the son who presents himself as obedient while running, around, running amok? Or am I the other who by all appearances is the black sheep, but in the end does what is needed? Which am I? Which are you? There is an accusation in this parable. Some who claim to obey God and observe the requirements of the word fail in actuality to do so. We see that in public all the time. We call it hypocrisy. Our society, society considers hypocrisy one of the greatest and certainly the most amusing sins. The environmentalist who travels in a private jet. The family values politician who gets caught in a brothel. I personally fantasize that Marie Kondo lives in a home even more cluttered than mine. <laughs> hypocrisy in others makes us feel good. I may be a sinner, but I admit it. <laughs> Jesus returns after telling this comparative parable to John. He returns accusation for accusation. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The one whose voice cried out in the wilderness, who was sent to prepare the way of the Lord, preaching repentance went unrecognized and unbelieved. They did not change their mind, Jesus tells us, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Which am I? Which will you be? We may, may not be the chief priests and elders of Jesus' day, asking the Messiah, accusing questions. Still, this parable may speak to us. When heard by the individual, one tries to make sense of the parable for oneself and apply it to one's own life. It has the ring of Romans 7. It may be a question of the good that we would do or can't, and the evil we don't want to do, but still. Jesus' parable in the end is a challenge. It asks us how we will respond to the truth of the gospel. Will we change our minds and believe or not? Or will we be the other son who pretends obedience or the son who turns around and changes his mind? I would rather not look at it as the son changed his mind. I would like to think that the son came to believe. That's a journey for all of us. Often my first reaction when God asks something of me is, no way. Eventually I come around though. And my turnaround time is getting shorter as my faith grows. So try and think about what is God, God is asking of you to do. And wait a minute before you answer. Let us pray. God, you ask so little of us in return for everything you have given. Help us to be receptive to your word. Give us the strength and wisdom to do what is required of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.